Welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shaw, and I'm joined, as always, by Sam Spieler and Yad Darris. Hello. Coming in last. Last place, best place. Hello, hello. Today we are continuing our series on the impossibility of a new home, which is about immigrants trying to establish a new home. This week we are discussing Julia Otsuka's The Buddha in the Attic. We've already discussed Austerlitz and Signs Preceding the End of the World. If this is your first time listening to us, we've got a book club discussion on Reddit at Canonical Pod. You can find that by clicking on the link in the episode description. And we are also on social media at Canonical Pod, all one word. If you'd like to support us and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link. That link is also in our episode description. Our review for this book was published last week. So let's talk about maybe the most striking part of this book, the point of view. Yeah, striking is a good word for it. The first person plural point of view is maybe the most unique feature of this novel. It's a pretty rare narrative mode, so much so, in fact, that Otsuka has talked about how few examples there are uh, when she was looking elsewhere for inspiration. In a few interviews, I saw two of the pieces of fiction she mentioned are The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides and A Rose for Emily, the short story by William Faulkner. There are similarities in how the we of these pieces work, but there are also some pretty significant differences. What are those similarities and differences that you see? I think that it depends on inclusivity. I think that in A Rose for Emily, that we is inclusive. The reader is invited to be part of the community. And in The Virgin Suicides, it's an exclusive we. We are looking at this group of characters who are very interested in the lives of these young women who have committed suicide, but we're not part of their group. Their fascination is also something that we're observing. I think when it comes to this novel, it's also exclusive. Even if the reader is Japanese, I don't think that she is a part of the group that is inside of that we. I think that it is separated from the reader in terms of time and space and ethnicity. So it's definitely an exclusive we. Yeah, I think that it does some other interesting things as well, though. This goes along with the parallelism that you mentioned in the last episode, Ian. The idea that several voices might be more credible than one. Uh, I think that would be true for Eugenides. I don't think it matters in Faulkner's story, uh, because as you point out, the effect is different and the inclusivity is different. But I think because we're working with historical fiction and accounts of women who might as well have been fact, that it gives this kind of feeling of uh, historicity, which I think, James, you mentioned in the last episode. And I, I think the we kind of goes along with that. But I feel like that's kind of where some of those similarities end. I think the distance that I talked about in the last episode is a big feature. We don't really get from the other two works that I've mentioned here because the we in those stories are the ones telling a story of what they see. But the we of Otsuka's novel is telling of their own personal experiences. Does that make sense, the difference there? I'm not sure I agree. Because I see it as someone telling someone else's story in the other books. Uh, even if it's from the we perspective, the main focus is on other characters outside of the we. Versus here, the we is the main character. The we is the focus. Okay, I, I get what you're saying there. When I was saying I disagree, it's just that in A Rose for Emily, the we is a person in the world of the story. It's several people's perspective, but it's one person speaking for that group. Right. And in The Virgin Suicides, it's one person speaking for the group. And it's a group of teenage boys who lives 
in the world of the novel in suburban Michigan in the 70s. But when it comes to this novel, the we, I don't take it to be the same person or any of the people in 1940s America. It's none of the characters. Instead, it's a person who seems to have omniscient access to all of the characters. This is something that a lot of people have been calling an unnatural narrative mode because it's calling attention to itself as being fiction. It's not possible for this person to be in the world of the novel. It's very clearly from outside of the world. I wonder if that contributes to the, the distance, the, the problem of feeling like I was always very far away from these characters, that there was always this big space between me and the we of this novel. And I wonder if it was an actual person and it wasn't, as you point out, this unnatural narrative mode. I wonder if that effect would be lessened or disappear completely. I think you're right. I think what it is, it's the we that people in traditional cultures often use when they talk about their ancestors. If you meet somebody in contemporary China and he says, we built the Great Wall, he doesn't really mean that he personally did it, but some point in the distant past, it was built by somebody that he identifies with. So there is a sort of identification happening between Otsuka's narrator and the characters in the novel, but it's not an exact one-to-one -one relationship where it's, I was part of this group and I'm talking about something that I did. So the complication here for me is if we look at A Rose for Emily, the we is used because there is a clear outsider in the short story. In the story, that's Emily. And everyone else is the we because there's the separation. In this book, my question is, is the we actually valid? Are these women actually in a community? They are separated from others, but are they actually a collective we? It, it's quite complicated because a lot of these women are going to these far-off places where they are the only Japanese. So it feels as if this we is being imposed onto them. Well, they become a we from outside and in retrospect. Yes. They don't know each other. They don't have a community to call themselves we, but looking backwards in time or looking outside in space, an outsider would call them we. Yes. An outsider who perhaps presumes that he is part of that group would say we, or an outsider who is not in the group would say they. But it's not something that they would use because they have any sort of kinship with themselves because... As I understand it, a lot of these women didn't know each other. Right. For me, it's actually not necessarily a criticism for a couple of reasons. The way the book is structured, they all arrive on boats, like in this book. So you get the impression that they arrive on boats together. This is historically untrue because they've obviously arrived on different boats. But in the book, it's set up in this way as if they come on a boat all together where they all know each other's stories. Uh, the first section talks about how this person is like this, but this other person's not like that. So you get this kind of bond that's formed on the boat. Uh, the book ends with everyone getting funneled into concentration camps. But it's not telling us that they've gone to different camps. It's just telling us like maybe they've gone here, maybe they've gone there. So you have this formation of a group at the beginning and the formation of a group at the end that creates the sense of community. I don't think that community actually existed, though, because if you actually look at the middle of the book, everyone is in different parts of Western United States. You have people in Reading, people in, um, I don't know, like in J-Town, people in San Jose, Hollister, all the places that are listed. So that's what's complicated. And I think it's not necessarily a criticism because, like you said, it's presenting the we in a way as if it's the outsider looking at them and grouping them together. 
And that does go together hand in hand with Japanese internment, because these people are not the same, but they've been forced to be the same because that's how they're viewed from the outside world, from the point of view of the government. It doesn't matter who they are individually, they are threats to national security. So on that level, if I think about it in that way, I can justify it because I think that's the complexity she's trying to infuse in the book. But the problem is, is that the book also tries really hard to let you know that these people are not actually connected because they go to all these different places and have these varied experiences. So that's what makes it a little bit difficult. I actually didn't mind that at all. It's just that kind of very fluid alliance that people have where when they want to recognize each other, they recognize each other, but then the, the alliance is very quickly dissolved. Like when, you know, two ethnic minorities, an Arab guy meets another Arab guy, he'll be like, hey, come on, man, we're brothers. Don't do this to me. And he expects a certain sort of treatment, but then very quickly the alliance is gone. So these kind of shifting groupings and communities are a part of reality. So I didn't mind it that way. This reminds me of my trip to Egypt, where my Egyptian tour guide was like, we're brothers, you're Chinese, I'm Egyptian, we hate Americans. And I'm like, I'm American. He's like, I don't hate Americans. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, pal. So for me, once again, the most interesting part is that you can look at it from a racist point of view. Right. You are forcing a, a collective view onto individuals. I don't mind that, though. Yeah, I don't mind it. I actually think it's a positive. Yeah, I would think that that is part of what she was going for. This is kind of what I was getting at in the last episode when I said that there's a distancing effect that Ron Charles article that I mentioned gets to, that this distancing works a little too well, that the effect is achieved, that we are given this kind of race-based view, and it creates this very strong we versus them, or us versus them. I think that's a good thing, but like James said, I don't think it goes too much deeper than that. It's not just race, though, because it's also their husbands that they are separated from. And it's also their children that they are separated from. That's true. That is actually one of the things that I found most interesting about this grouping is that you can look at it as the we, as all Japanese Americans. But yeah, it really is about these picture rides who just happen to fall into that category sometimes in the book. If I were to levy a critique, I think that's where it falls apart a little bit. I think when you look at just race, for me, it makes sense in terms of the big picture of what this book is trying to achieve. But when you start dissecting it and saying, well, they're also separated from their children, they're also separated from the friends back home, it gets really complicated because then you're really trying to enforce this kind of community onto these women. And you're saying they only have each other, but they don't. It's clear from this book that they don't have each other because they are frequently isolated. Right. They don't really have anyone. Or they, they have people, but they are tenuous connections. So it feels like it's a taxonomic endeavor rather than anything really organic or natural. It's as if Otsuka is saying, this group of people, they all belong together. It feels like she's imposing those boundaries. I think that those boundaries are really important. And that was kind of central to the way I read this novel. In my reading, the novel hinges upon a contrast between the plurality of experiences that we see in the first seven chapters and the singularity of the collective Japanese that the white narrators refer to in the eighth. So there is a big point of view shift in the eighth chapter where we have the white characters who remained outside of the internment camps talking about how much they miss the Japanese. This contrast is enjoyable. It creates an enjoyable tension because it can show you how what is so rich and varied from within a group or from in a personal experience can be so easily contained by others outside of that group. 
My problem, though, or my concern here is how Otsuka shows us how these are two equally valid perspectives on the same reality, but she doesn't problematize the white perspective, or she doesn't problematize the outsider perspective. So if we say that the outsider perspective is as valid as the insider perspective, then what does that mean for all of the other racial stereotyping that we see in this novel? Because this novel has a lot of remarks made by Japanese and white characters about Mexicans and black people and Chinese as well. So are those perspectives and those stereotypes meant to be as valid as anything else? Or is this a limitation of Otsuka's politics in this novel? So, Ied, here, when you say outside perspective, do you mean specifically the white American perspective at that time? I think that in the novel, we hear mostly from the white American outside perspective of Japanese people, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It's just the way that any person outside of a group can refer to that group accurately as saying the Japanese. I don't think that Otsuka highlights any sort of inaccuracy in that type of move. I think that when we read that final chapter, the white characters referring to the Japanese are not erroneous. They don't say anything out of hand. They don't say anything that seems wrong. And I think that this is something that you'd mentioned in the previous episode. Actually, I think you were off the record at that point, Sam, but Atsuka shows the white characters in the end of the novel in a very sympathetic light. And I'm wondering if that sympathy makes us kind of accept the casual racism of the characters that we see elsewhere in the novel. I think there is some concern for that. That's interesting that you pointed out in that way, because my concern was more that we're a little too sympathetic to the white characters at the end. But I didn't extrapolate that to the other ethnic groups. I wasn't concerned, though, because I felt that those stereotypes, they very clearly turned back on the people that were stereotyping. So when either the Japanese or the white narrators are saying those things, I felt it was very clearly racist that you're not supposed to sympathize with that or you're not supposed to say, oh, yes, the Chinese aren't as diligent or as good with doing laundry as the Japanese. I think you're supposed to see that, oh yeah, this was a pretty terrible time with terrible people with terrible views on race. This is a point of clarification because it's hard for me to join the two points here. The first point being the casual racism levied at other minorities. And the second point being treating the white characters with kid gloves. For me, these two are almost not related. Are you two both thinking that it's related? I think the relation that I see is that when the white characters speak about the Japanese characters, it demonstrates, at least I think it demonstrates in my reading, a belief that people can look at a group of others from the outside and speak about them in generalization, but be accurate. And that's fine, but when we see other generalizations elsewhere in the novel, they're often pejorative. So if it's not problematic in one instance, how do we feel about it in these other instances? So to make it more concrete, what you're saying is when these white employers are saying to these Japanese women that you are very hardworking, that your floor is so clean, we can eat off of it, that seems real, right? That's presented to us as truth. So that when they say something like, I never bring my laundry to any Chinese dry cleaners, or now that you're gone, I have to use a Chinese dry cleaners, then that also is given the same measure of truth. Is that what you're saying? It's not the specific comments, but rather the perspective and the validity of the outsider perspective. Uh, I think it's also important that the people who are making these outsider comments are not just their employers, but just other people in their towns and the places where they live. They often have 
a perspective that is never shown to be faulty, even though they're outsiders and they say things about Japanese people in general, we don't see any scenes where what they're saying is wrong. And I think that even some minor instances of that would show the flaws of generalizations. And I don't think that there are so many flaws that you need to beat it over the reader's head, but I think that it's just so tidy that it makes it seem like the racism on both the Japanese and white characters' parts is valid. One of the feelings I got from the end was that the white characters are speaking fondly of these people who are not there, partly because they th did feel fondly about some of the Japanese characters, but also because they're not there. That it's this kind of hindsight, oh, we could have, maybe we should have spoken up. Maybe we should have done something. I don't know if I really believe them that they feel that way. It's easy to condemn the government for doing something because you don't have to take credit for that wrongdoing. There is some aspersions cast by some of the white characters that we are given some of that, but that gets very <laughs> whitewashed at the very end. So I don't know how much I believe that perspective. Well, that's kind of related to what Yed was saying before in that it's not problematized enough. And I agree. I think actually the last section or chapter is in some ways the most important chapter or section, but it's also the part where I think Otsuka missteps. I think she didn't find that balance that is required. Part of it is, in my opinion, I think it's the limitations of point of view and what she's been trying to do in the whole book. When she introduces the white point of view at the end, you can also go too far and make them, you know, cartoonish villains. And you can also do what she did, which is to not go far enough to present a variety of problematic points of view. I think she did not strike the correct balance. Like she veered a little bit too much on the safe side. I think perhaps it's not even a criticism so much as just an area where she could have and perhaps should have gone further. Because in the first seven chapters of the novel, we are shown the richness of the experience of these Japanese Americans. It's very vibrant and full of color. And then when we get to the eighth chapter, it's a very marked thinness. The way that they think and talk about the Japanese is very thin and naive. And like I said earlier, that contrast is enjoyable. But I think what she could have done is she could have shown us what that thinness meant. What does it mean for a group of outsiders to understand a group in this very thin and naive way? And what does it mean? What is the tension between inside and outside? That, to me, I think would have elevated this novel beyond just being sort of a historical document to being more of a work of art. Uh, I don't know if, again, I can criticize Otsuka because it is a very challenging theme to take up, but it's also something that deviates from the course that she seems to want to take with this novel. So I guess we're saying the same thing. It's not that, you know, she needs to do more work. It's that this is not her intention, I think. And it's difficult to speak about intention. But for me, when I read this book in its entirety, I feel like her intention is to make you feel an emotional response. I don't get the feeling that she really wants you to think about how easily you can look at a group of people one day and then the next day they're gone. And then in six months, you don't really think about them anymore. She kind of signals toward it in a very superficial way. Like when she talked about that boy, I think Lester, holding on to someone's sweater. And yeah. then that's a moment of complication. Like, what do I do with the sweater? But that's it. And it seems like that's where it needs to be tilted toward. This reminds me of what I mentioned in the last episode about learning from art. Like, with the way that the novel is now, what we can learn from this novel is just that this happened. But 
my suggestion here about focusing on this thinness would allow us to learn something more about the way human beings live with each other in societies and to show the differences between how people in a group and outside of a group look at this group and what that difference means. That to me would make it more substantial and more full of meaning and more the type of art learning that I think is really valuable. But again, it seems like Otsuka is not really interested in that. So I think that if she had tried and failed to include that, it would have watered down what she did achieve. So I don't necessarily fault her for avoiding this. And I mean, I'll just go one step further and say the reason why it doesn't work is because if your purpose in this book is to stoke an emotional response from the life of these Japanese picture brides, then you can't at the end, kind of zoom away from that, you have to keep your focus on these women. And the effect or the intended effect of switching to the white point of view is to feel that emotion again, because these are all the women that you loved through 150 pages, and now they're gone. That's the intended effect of the last chapter. Yeah. Let's take a break now. When we come back, We'll talk about how neatly this book fits in our series. Welcome back. So how's this book related to our greater theme in the series, The Impossibility of a New Home? I think it's quite clear that at least in America in 1942, if you looked like you weren't a white American, America was never really going to be yours. People would see you, but they would see you as Japanese first. And If you were Japanese first, that home that you thought was yours could always be taken away from you. There was something I read on Wikipedia. I think it was a court case that took place in, I want to say, Placer County, where a group of white men, I think they set fire to a Japanese family's barn or something. And in their defense, they claimed that This was done to ensure that America was a white America, and they got off. That was a viable defense at the time. Jeez. Yeah, I think this fits pretty neatly, too. Even the the term home is complicated here, because I guess what else would you call it? But it doesn't really feel like a capital H home in a lot of the cases that were given here. Like there's even some imagery approaching bucolic in some cases where later toward the book in about the two thirds range, when we see families that have moved away into the countryside and have a little bit of land and they own their own small farms, it sounds almost nice, but it's tinged with what you know is about to happen and what ends up happening and that that goes to this impossibility that they were facing at the time. You do get this feeling of loss when they are interned. Like there is some semblance of home being lost, the home that they've created. So it's not, I think, entirely impossible if we just, you know, judge it on those grounds. I feel like when they're being interned, they are losing their home. Another interesting way of looking at this question, actually, the impossibility of a new home, is when the Japanese Americans and Japanese uh, immigrants were interned, they were asked to fill out a questionnaire. 
and the questionnaire was supposed to gauge their loyalty, one of the questions was, would you renounce loyalty to the emperor? And this is really complicated because quite a few of the people who were interned were not American citizens. So if they renounced loyalty to the emperor and Japanese citizenship, they would actually have become stateless citizens. Hmm. They literally will not have a home or will not belong to a state because if you were not an American citizen and you renounced your citizenship to Japan, what are you? I think it's also significant that, well, a lot of the people in the camps were first-generation immigrants. A lot of the people were even second or third generation Japanese immigrants with very little tie to Japan. You would imagine just from the outside that these people have a Japan to return to, but actually as a second or third generation immigrant, that's not really your country. And I think that to presume, you know, from the white American perspective in the 40s that you could repatriate these people, it just shows a really ridiculous understanding of the immigrant experience to imagine that these people could have left, that they could be anything but Americans at that point. I don't know if this was all of California or just one county, but I know there was at least one county they used the 116th rule. If you were more than 116th Japanese, then you were interned. So yeah, I mean, that goes down, what, like four generations? Which is almost everyone in <laughs> in the U.S. at that time who are Japanese. All right, let's stop here. Thank you for listening. Next week, we will be concluding our series, The Impossibility of a New Home. We've got an updated reading schedule on Reddit at Canonical Pod. And if you'd like to join us and talk to us, just hop on. We have a book club discussion every Friday. We'd love to hear your thoughts. If you enjoy this podcast, we would really appreciate it if you left us a nice review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. That really helps other people find this podcast and helps us build this community. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.